Russia's GDP, and I think I'm ballpark right, like around one and a half trillion dollars, is our federal government spent like six trillion dollars in 2020. Like our just our one trillion government. on the military. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. And like like our government spending is more than their entire economy. Yeah. The, and our and, military and our, budget is our equivalent mili- to it. Our military budget is like <laughs> yeah. very close to their entire GDP. Yeah. The idea that this is even like plausible, that they could pose some threat that like, oh, my God, we better dominate the world because if we don't, Russia will dominate the world like we're going bankrupt. We are right, going so bankrupt. Here's, dominating the, here's the, world. the rub, though, Dave, is this is what uh, Gareth Porter, he wrote his book about Vietnam. It's called mm-hmm. The Perils of Dominance. Right. And it's about the problem in Vietnam was America was too strong and they thought they could do whatever they yeah. want. But then that'll cause problems, because guess what? At some point, Ho Chi Minh would rather fight than give in. And that's just sorry for rhyming there, but that's just true how yeah. it is. And same thing for, uh, you know, the. Uh, uh, Politburo in Beijing and same thing for Vladimir Putin and his interest in Russia. There are red lines from their point of view. That was his words the other day. He said if if America were to start introducing troops or significantly increasing their arms transfers to Ukraine, that that would be a red line. And um, I think I've quoted this to you before where uh, years ago, our current director of the CIA, William Burns, had written, it's in the WikiLeaks, uh, Julian Assange uh, sitting in solitary confinement at Joe Biden's behest at the uh, Belmarsh uh, terror prison there in the UK right now over this. Um, but Burns wrote home after a meeting with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. And in, in the WikiLeaks document is called Nyet means Nyet. And Lavrov is very polite, but he says in no uncertain terms, that if you guys try to bring Ukraine into, into NATO, we will do something to prevent that from happening. We would do anything to prevent that from happening. So that's as nice as a diplomat can threaten war right there, essentially. And then not long after that, Vladimir Putin, I don't know if this was a hot mic moment or if it was meant to be or if it really was an accident or exactly. It might have just been it might have just been that the guy later told the story, Dave, now that I think about it, I forget. But it was a, a Italian diplomat, some kind of like, uh, you know, their ambassador to the EU or some kind of thing like that. Some weird title. But it's this Italian diplomat. And Putin told him that, you know, we could be in Kiev in two weeks. In other words, this is a red line. And, yeah, we might get into a nuclear war with the Americans if they're going to be that stubborn about it and get into a war with us about it. Then I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But are we going to let Ukraine be absorbed into America's military alliance and have them station their best weapons and including their, you know, medium range missiles and all of these things, you know, a couple of hundred miles from Moscow? No, we're not going to allow that to happen. We're just not going to do that. And, it's, you know, they're already, of course, threatened by um, American weapons in the uh, Baltic states, although I'm not exactly I don't think they have the mid-range missile launchers there, but they do have them in Poland. I think we talked about this before. It's the, I'm sorry, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. The MK-41 missile launchers. These are the anti-ballistic missile missile launchers, Dave. Oh, but you can also fire a Tomahawk nuclear-armed cruise missile from the very same missile launcher. It's a perfectly dual-use piece of equipment. So they say it's just defensive. And really, if you bring a lot of defense that close to your enemy's place at some point, again, it's a provocation and offense. But here it actually literally has this uh, very easy dual use switch kind of a deal where you could drop a, a tomahawk well, in the same launcher and use it. So, um, you know, they already have that essentially in Poland and they already have American forces in uh, the Baltic states as well. And they're just saying they're drawing the line at Ukraine. And America's pushing their luck where they shouldn't. Oh, here I get to quote Pat Buchanan. I like this quote. It's really important. In fact, people should read Pat about this because he knows a lot about this. He's been writing about this for a very long time. We run him at antiwar.com slash Pat if people want to catch up. In fact, he sent us a new one today about it, I think. Um, but he says, listen. Oh, really? Did he? Oh, I got to yeah. check that out. Yeah. I'm so he, sure he was that. Nixon's guy, right? That's where he got mm-hmm. his big start was he was Nixon and then Reagan's speechwriter. Um, but so he was there during detente and, and the 
the war in Vietnam and all these things. He was always a Cold War hawk. Probably he was one of the most right wing members in Nixon's cabinet when it but came. But he to went him. he went to the meeting with Mao Zedong too. Like he was there. Oh, really? for, like, yeah, yeah. I could have forgotten he that went, if I knew that. He wow. went he went to China with them and he uh he said it made his stomach sick. Yeah, uh, I but bet he it was did. like, yeah, he was and and Nixon was like saying nice things about Mao, and like he was like just furious, and he had to write him. I bet. I mean, I don't yeah. know if that, I don't right. know if that part's true, but I bet he did. I bet he had to right. write like it was like, hey, Nixon was like, business. Shout out, write me some nice things about Mao Zedong. Right. And Pat Buchanan's That's like, for heaven's sake, what? I know. So Chas Freeman, who's now you know the great China Dove, um, was there. He was the translator for Nixon and Mao. And so, it, you know, people can can really do a lot worse than to read Chas Freeman on this stuff, right. uh, for sure as well. But, you know, as anti-interventionist as Pat is now famously, you know, among us and uh, our friends, he's still a hawk as hell when it comes to the old Cold War. If you bring up the old Cold War. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was the commies. That was the Reds. That's just different, you know, and he's been great since 1991. Um but, you know, on the Cold War stuff, still a hawk to this day, totally unapologetic. By the way, for um, people who, who know but, about and I want to either, uh, but for people who know about this history, which is really so fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. And because and Pat Buchanan, of course, was like the the leader of the kind of paleo conservative movement that really challenged the neocons and lost, <laughs> really lost uh, to yeah. them. Uh, he ran, you know, in uh, 1992, I guess, uh, uh, for president challenged George H.W. Bush in the primaries. He opposed the uh, the first Persian Gulf War in Iraq and and was completely against after the Soviet Union fell completely against the idea like he he kind of critique of libertarianism that was like listen we should be non interventionists you're absolutely right but we got this Soviet Union and so we right. can't be and he's like absolutely right and then when the Soviet Union fell he was like oh great. Now we get to go back to being non-interventionist and all the Buckleyites were like, whoa, slow yeah, down, Brad. Right. Like, that's not actually, we were just saying that, but, you know, actually I'm a CIA man and we're going to keep it. Anyway, right. but there's this one interview you have and you have a lot of interviews with Pat Buchanan, but there was this one where he's just so great about everything. And then at the end of it, I don't know if you remember this, but you go, ah, Pat, next time you, we get you on, we're going to have to convince you that the whole Cold War was terrible too. And he's like, well, I don't know about that, Scott. Oh, that's but, uh, it's just so great. No, anyway, I should, I'm sorry. I wish I'd remembered that. I'd have tried to follow up. Maybe I should now. I think you did interview him again, but nah, you're never yeah. going to convince him of that. Tom came close one time when he had oh, him on yeah, his no, uh, show. Yeah. You know, but Tom came right. close to convincing him that you go, you know, the war in Vietnam was a disaster. I mean, you have to admit, Pat, that like, you know, look, for all the things you care about, about the culture back home. What did the war in Vietnam do for you? It, it it totally undermined your conservative traditional culture and led to the up, you know, the rising of the, the hippies and the anti-war movement and all this. And what did we get for it at the end? And Tom kind of pushed him on it. But Tom is such a nice guy that he pushed him gently and he got almost like a half you know, all right, well, there is something to that kind of thing. And you're like, all right, well, that's something. And come on, Ho won the war anyway. Yeah, you didn't After, even win the war. You, know, you didn't even yeah, get it. 10, 15 years of killing people and he still lost and knocked over the domino in Cambodia, leading right to the rise of Pol Pot, for God's sake. And, so, and, but, but even by Pat Buchanan, to attack Pat Buchanan from the Pat Buchanan, you're like, what you really right. care about is a conservative culture here at home in America. Right. And what did you do for that? For, for not even a victory abroad. Right. You got this huge got loss. Day glow and LSD, man. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Anyway, so he said this smart stuff about Russia one time. He says, in the Cold War, we drew the line at the Elbe River, which is halfway across Germany. And we told the Russians... If you roll into West Germany and try to conquer West Germany and or France and Spain and our friends, Denmark and Belgium, we'll fight you and we'll use nukes if we have to to fight you to keep you in Eastern Europe. But that's it. Now, during that time, we had the uprising in Hungary and I'm sorry, I was, I was getting this wrong. I think it's 56. Um, where Ike Eisenhower, I think the CIA had helped been responsible for encouraging that. But then when the tanks came, they said, hey, come on, what are we going to do, man? You're in Hungary. You're way, 
east of the Elbe River, my friend, and and you're just behind the Iron Curtain and there's nothing that we can do for you. The you know, same thing happened in Czechoslovakia in 1968 in the Prague Spring. And again, the Soviets sent in the tanks to crush the uprising. And Lyndon Johnson said, tough, man. We're not going to war for Czechoslovakia. You know, you can call me Neville Chamberlain if you want. Right. But, but you know, call it Munich if you want. We're not going to war for Czechoslovakia. So then in the 80s, the uh, they had solidarity and the uprising in Poland. And I don't think the Soviet, I don't know if they violently crushed it. Maybe they just kind of arrested everybody rather than like using military force. I forgot exactly, but they essentially, you know, suppressed the uprising. And Ronald Reagan said, well, shame on you. But he didn't do anything about it. You know, what was he going to do? And that was Neville Chamberlain's next mistake. You know, that was the real mistake was given a war guarantee to Poland. When England yeah. didn't have the ability to guarantee Poland's independence from anybody, Hitler, Stalin, or anybody else, and neither did Ronald Reagan. Well, Reagan didn't make Chamberlain's mistake. He didn't give him a war guarantee. He said, you know, it's really sad what's happening to the Poles right now, and the whole world should condemn the Soviet Union for it. And good for him for that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Now, look at what we've done. We took the line and we moved it a thousand miles east, 1,200 miles east, right to Russia's border. So now, again, we call it deterrence. We call it our umbrella. Now, it, all we have to say is we will protect any country in Europe, and then no one will ever mess with them because of how powerful we are. And so far, this has seemingly worked, but we're talking about an absolute blink of a moment in time. And we're talking about a policy, which again, as you're saying, you're talking about threatening all of mankind with this. And again, with the idea that, come on, at the end of the day, what's Putin going to do? He'll give in. But why would he give in? Why would he say he has a red line if he doesn't mean it? And maybe we should take that seriously. Again, yeah. Ho Chi Minh, took on the greatest empire that ever existed. Same for the Sunni insurgency in Iraq and the Taliban in Afghanistan. They just said, we'd rather fight you than not. What? And they died trying too, and they won too at the end. So the idea that, again, Gareth Porter calls it the perils of dominance. Joe Biden looks at his order of battle and says, I can order the world around but it's just a presumption that doesn't hold true. And in fact, I think Joe Biden is old enough, as dumb as he is, he's old enough to finally have the wisdom rub off on him that this is not really worth fighting yeah. for. 